brand new song just released and you are hearing it here for the first time and he has a brand new CD just introduced today I'm telling you uh, that's my son in the Lord he is a blessing give another hand Tony Mason great oh we got a CD here Can I? how many of you remember like a copy of that song uh, all right here we go You can pick up that beautiful song at the table, at our resource table, and just look for Tony Mason. All of his songs I play in my car. I sleep with this guy. When I was in the Ukraine some years ago, I played his music all during my time in the Ukraine because I couldn't speak Russian. So it's good to hear English all the time. And uh, he is such an awesome writer. He wrote that song. Give him another hand. Great writer. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, men. Can you hold your brother's hands on your right and left and tell your brother if you knew who I really was? You would take me for lunch today. sit yet please hold that hand one more time the word of God says wherever any two shall touch and agree concerning anything on the earth it shall be done for them of our father who is in heaven tell your neighbor I'm about to agree with you and something's gonna happen repeat after me Heavenly Father fill this place with revelation knowledge Fill this place with the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding. And I expect to change forever right here in Jesus' name. And I agree it is done. Now go ahead and act like you just heard your prayer. Hallelujah! Oh, what a wonderful place to be. You may be seated. I'm going to invite all my, all my young men who flew with me just now to come up on the stage real quick. I want all my men, including my pilots, come up here real fast. Got to run, 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 run. Uh, these guys love you so much that they came all the way from the Bahamas today just to be with you all. Welcome all these Bahamian leaders, these great men. Just make a line there. These are my, these are my, uh, my, my covering angels. Uh, this is my captain who flies the plane. This is his co-pilot. This is the engineer who is the engineer for all aircrafts. This is a lawyer. He takes care of legal business. This is the doctor. Takes care of your body. And this is the car dealer who makes sure we get something to drive. He owns his own car business. And this guy is an import-export dealer. He brings in all the good stuff for you to eat. And uh, what do you do? I'm just me, man. That's all. <laughs> no, he's a technician. Give him a hand. And what do you do? I'm the future prime minister of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Did you all hear that? What he said is he's the future president of my country. That's what I call dream. Come on, give him a hand. And what do you do? I'm the best electrician in the world. Give these men a big hand. Oh, great leaders. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to the Bahamas, guys. Come on, make them feel at home. The group from the Bahamas, my boys. So glad to have them here. I am so proud of our coordinator and uh, the whole team that put this together. The hardest working leader, I tell you, these guys work so hard. And I want to thank you so much for bringing the men together in this great setting of uh, For Men Only Retreat. I'd like for you to get your notebooks, please, and find something to write some notes on for a few minutes. And uh, we are going to get involved in the subject that we are studying this 
couple of days, myself and the bishop are going to be dealing with issues that are important to you as men. And of course, my good friend, Brother Eddie Long, is going to be here to also tie up this whole thing on Saturday. It's going to be a fantastic week. And I look forward to being with you these few days. Uh, I'm from the Bahamas where God lives. And uh, I left the Bahamas this morning and the ocean, when we were driving to the airport, the ocean was crystal clear with beautiful coconut trees just waving in the beautiful wind there in the Bahamas. And I kept thinking, why am I going to Texas? I'm leaving all this beauty behind. But God's destiny requires that I be here with you today. And I'm happy to be in God's will. I see uh, one of my uh, senior trustees on my board of leaders here today. Please stand up. Uh, uh, this is uh, Bishop Charles Phillips. Stand up. One of my great trustees on my board here. Flew all the way from Washington, D.C. to be with us today. Give him a hand. Good to see you, Doc. God bless you. I'm going to use a PowerPoint presentation so that you can take good notes because, you know, men are logical thinkers. And so I always like to give information to men that men can take their time and grasp and understand. And uh, for the next two days, I'm going to be focusing on two subjects. One of them is understanding the purpose and the power of male man. Understanding the purpose and the power of the male man. And then session two, I'm going to be dealing with rediscovering the principle of fatherhood. And so in this subject today, we're going to talk about understanding the purpose and power of the male man. Now, one of the number one things I want to encourage you men to do is to educate yourself. And uh, so I spoke to my office in Florida and directed them to ship to Texas just for you materials that I have been working with for the last 34 years. It took me 34 years to develop this and I have been privileged to ship them here for you. So we got some material to help you as a man develop yourself. The number one pursuit of a male should be knowledge and we're gonna show you why that's important today I've been married for 27 years a beautiful woman I have a son and daughter both of them are studying their master's degree right now very young kids but they're already doing their master's degree I've never had a problem with my son or my daughter they are virgins they love God they went through the adolescence period without incident they are now respectable young people who are honored in their education. I started a church in the Bahamas 25 years ago with seven people. Today it is a worldwide movement in over 80 countries influencing people. We have one of the largest churches in our country. And one of the major things we focus on in our ministry from day one is building a church of males, strong men. And one of the things I've been working on for the last 30 years is researching and understanding what makes a male unique and different from a female and what makes a male think differently and what kind of psyche does a male have that makes him distinctive from a female. And my research have led me to build one of the strongest male concentrated churches in our country. Most of you who are in this room probably came from a history where you were brought up with women. Maybe your teachers were women. Maybe you're in a house with just a mother. And so most of the men in our world have been feminized. And that doesn't mean effeminate. It simply means that they've been cultured by females. That creates some problems. And one of the things that I've tried to do is to try and find out what are the secrets to correct that. And I did so much research that I was able to help not only my son and my daughter to understand what real mankind and manhood is, 
but to help thousands of men build strong lives and to build strong character. And I have put a lot of this material in a number of items I want to recommend to you. There is a book that you'll find out on the resource table called The Purpose and Power of the Male Man. And we're going to be dealing with some of that material today. And that is a partner book to another book called The Power of Woman. And in this book, you understand why a woman is different from a man. And men need to study women. Because the average man doesn't understand a woman. It took me about 27 years to figure out my wife. <laughs> I did a lot of reading and research and study, not only in the Word, but also in a lot of other material. And this book is now one of the top selling books on women on Amazon.com and other stores. Because in this book, I deal with the five distinctive needs of a woman that a man needs to know. Women only need five things. And the average man don't know the first one. And that's why it's tough to live with a woman. Because you live with people to meet their needs. And if you don't know their needs, then you have a problem. The third product I want to recommend to you is a book called The Spirit of Leadership. And this book deals with how to develop the leader on the inside that we heard about just now from our psalmist, Tony Mason. Uh, this book took me 32 years to write because the material in it I didn't understand it until I had to develop it over 32 years. I want to recommend that to you. I, before we're going to have a little sold out session on that one, but uh, you may want to get that as soon as we finish. And then this book deals with developing your personal glory as a man. Every man is carrying glory on the inside and he needs to learn how to bring that glory out. And that is coupled by my number one selling book on vision uh, on Amazon.com right now. If you type the word vision in and press search, this book will come up as number one. It's been number one on the Amazon.com list for the past three months. It's the number one best-selling book on vision. I didn't expect that. And I discovered that the corporate companies are ordering this book by the thousands to give to their managers and their executives because they're trying to capture vision for their companies. But every male in this room must have a vision for his life. Otherwise, he cannot ask a woman to follow him. Because it's an insult to ask someone to follow you and you don't know where you're going. So I highly recommend that you get this set of material. This is our number one best-selling book on single men and divorced men. The book deals with all the subjects of divorce and marriage and, and also deals with singleness. And if you are a single man, I encourage you to get a copy of this one. If you have been through a divorce, please get two copies. Just in case you have another prospect, you don't want to repeat your problems. Say amen. amen. And the way you avoid that is by knowledge. This book sold 800,000 copies and still selling. It's been in the top 10 list for the past six years, which is a mystery to the publishers. But it's because the material in it has become so in demand that people continue to buy this book. And I want to recommend, we got a few of those here with us today, Invest in Yourself. This is our number one best-selling book at the moment. And that's the book called Rediscovering the Kingdom, which is available uh, here today. And I hope you can get your copies of that. Uh, the last couple items I want to recommend is our book here that deals with the 26 differences between a male and a female. And if you know these 26 differences, you will never have a problem with a woman. A woman has 26 differences that are distinct from you. And you've got to know what they are to be an effective man. This book deals with those 26 differences. This book has been well researched and I recommend it to you. It is now available in all the stores around the city, but you get it for special today, so you definitely want to pick that up for the special price. There's a power pack that's available in the back and that is all five of these books are available for 80 bucks. Uh, regularly, you have to pay $125, so we are really giving you a gift back of over 40 bucks. Is that a good idea? If you don't say amen, I'm gonna put the price back up to the normal price. Okay, I know you're not dumb men, you're smart, right? So you can get all those back there, and because I can't deal with all the material, that's why I asked them to ship these up here to you, so you can go back and educate yourself and invest in your own future by developing yourself. Uh, on the aircraft just now, I was telling our men, all the men are reading books, because in our church, I train the men that they have to keep reading. I read five books, uh, four books a month, sometimes five, depending on the size of the book, 
And I read four books a month because I am an ambassador to many countries by my, by my government. I am counselor to many countries, heads of states. I'm involved in advising governments in many different nations in Africa, in South America, in the Philippines, etc. So I have to keep knowledge always available. So I keep reading. If you're going to be a leader, you got to be a reader. Say that. So you got to shut the TV off, open a book, and get your brain filled with knowledge. Because knowledge is the key to an effective man. So I want to recommend that you invest in yourself and get this material because knowledge is power and the more you get it, the more you are able to handle life's challenges. So I will be available to autograph books, which I don't normally do because my crowds that I deal with are very large. My last crowd that I spoke with was 180,000 people in Africa, in Nigeria, and they wanted me to autograph books. So I had to apologize. But since you are brothers, and we are all in here by ourselves, there ain't no woman in here, I'm going to be with you as long as you need me to be with you. I'll autograph books. Uh, my publisher told me that my autograph is worth $85,000 so far. So if you're smart, you'll buy a book for 15 bucks, but make sure you get $85,000 worth of value in it, okay? And then when I die, you cash it in. <laughs> all right, get your notebooks. Let's go to work. The purpose and the power of the mailman understanding the kingdom concept of manhood let's get started I'd like to make a couple of statements first about men and male the world is filled with males but very few men and the reason for that is because Male is a biological reality. You're born a male, but you're not born a man. Manhood is a result of development and investment in yourself. So you don't need to do anything to be a male. Just show up. But you got to do a lot of things to be a man. You got to learn, develop, be trained. You have to grow. And that is why the average male is still struggling with being a man because we've been taught that just existing makes us a man. And that's not true. There are 50-year-old males who are not men yet. Because being a man is different from being born a male. This is why there's a struggle. Male is a natural, but manhood is spiritual. Male is natural. It's a product of nature. But being a man is spiritual. It is a product of development. Again, this is why a lot of men are struggling with trying to define what manhood is. I'm going to help you today. We live in a century that doesn't understand us as men. As a matter of fact, I don't think that there has been a century in history that is more difficult for the male than this one we're living in right now. And I'm going to prove that hopefully in a few minutes. Here's a statement that was recorded by the first book of Moses about God's creation. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 says, So God created man in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. God only made male and female. So the only species that God recognized in the human race is a male and a female. So some people are trying to create a third one. Now, let me just say something that you didn't think about. Read that verse again out loud, read. So God created man and he made them in two models. What's the models? Male and female 
created he them. That means anything else that exists was not created by God. Someone else created that. Can I hear an amen? amen. Tell your neighbor, I hope God created you. <laughs> Very important. Hey, Bishop, give Bishop a big hand. That's the man. That's the, that's the man that God created. <laughs> Thank you. Genesis chapter 1 verse 31 says, And God saw that all he had created, and God said it was very good. Now this is an important statement because you see a lot of women have been saying that men are no good. But if God calls something good, come on brothers, go with me now, then it must be good. In spite of what people say, you are good stuff. Clap for yourself. That means that when a man is behaving badly, he is not himself. <laughs> because according to God, the product he made is good. So if a man is not living a good manly life then he is not acting his normal self he is malfunctioning God didn't make any male that is no good so under all of the no good there's a good and this conference and this retreat is to work on getting the good that's been buried under what the women call no good because we got good men sitting around you right now tell you and brother I'm a good man y'all got to talk back to me now say it I'm a good man say it loud I'm a good man I don't care what kind of father you had according to God you are a good man give a good man a big hand however the male man is in crisis and the fact that you showed up here today is proof that you recognize that you need some help and there's nothing wrong with asking for help as a matter of fact it takes a real man to go for help what kind of crisis is the male man facing I've identified one of them and that is the number one crisis of the male man write this down is his identity crisis He's struggling with discovering the truth about himself. That's why men are imitating so many other things and other men because they haven't found themselves yet. That's why we wear other men like Calvin Klein, Fubu, Sean John. We wear other people because we're struggling with our own identity. A lot of men don't feel like they are somebody unless they're wearing somebody. I just getting started. This conference has been called by God and God brought us together to peel away all the other images. Because deep inside of you is a brother the world needs to meet. If you believe that, go ahead and shout for five seconds. The male in our century is confused about his manhood, his masculinity, and his sexuality. Three confusions. He's not sure what a man is. He's not sure what it means to be masculine. And he definitely is struggling with his sexuality identity. As a matter of fact, I found out something. It is so tough to be a real man, a lot of men decide to be women. We need to confront the problem because it's not difficult to solve once you confront it. 
As a matter of fact, men have confused their cultural and social and traditional roles with the definition of manhood. And that's where our first conflict begins. We have confused what we are culturally and what we do traditionally in our culture and the roles we perform with being synonymous with manhood. And what has happened is all of those have been destroyed. What made your father a man does not exist anymore. I'm going to prove that in a few minutes. What made your father masculine does not exist anymore. What made your father a respectable man in his generation does not exist in yours. So your father, listen carefully now, please listen, this is going to be a tough one. Your father cannot give you advice on how to be a man. That's a tough statement. The reason is because what made him a man doesn't exist anymore. You got to stay with me now. I want to show you what happened. Here are the questions that all men are asking, and you asking them too, because I asked them. Number one, how do you measure manhood? Number two, what is true manhood? Number three, what is masculinity? Number four, what is true male sexuality? Number five, what is the purpose of the male in relationship to the female? Number six, is there a universal definition of manhood and can it be attained? And number seven, where do we get the true male definition from? Who defines what a male and a man is? These are important questions because every culture and every social environment seems to have their own definition of what a man's supposed to be. So these questions plague us. And these questions are not getting some sensible answers. And I know that because I deal with men constantly in seminars and conferences all over the world. I was in Zimbabwe, had a conference for men, 5,000 men in a hotel in Harare, and they kept me there for seven days. I spoke four times a day, 28 times in one week. And they said, just teach us on manhood. When I left, I got a call from the president's office, Mugabe. They sent him a tape. And he said, I want you to come back to the great nation of Zimbabwe to talk to the whole country. Because nations are understanding that men are struggling, including the presidents of countries. You see, title doesn't make you a man. The male is in crisis. Men define their manhood by their social roles. I want you to hear me carefully now because I'm going to see if I can help you shed some of the images that are trapping the great man on inside of you. We're also suffering from what I call cultural transitions. That means the major shift in the roles of both male and females have confused men. The rules and the roles of society are changing and we need to understand them because the roles that your father performed does not exist anymore. And the rules that your father followed to be a man have been canceled. So if you get your manhood from rules and roles, you are in trouble. Because if you are a man based on what you do, then what you do, if it's canceled, you no longer exist. And our 21st century has canceled the rules it has eradicated the roles. Let me show you what I mean. Man's basic concept of manhood have been disrupted. Your father had no problem being a man. It was easy for your granddaddy to be a man, very easy. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna show you what he did to be a man. You see, men and women are in a state of gender transition. Women are trying to be men. And men, oh Lord, are trying to be women. So everybody's confused. And then women 
are now doing the things that men used to do. So we are in a, what I call a historical convulsion and a historical convergence. We are in the midst of change. That's why I started out by saying that the most difficult time for men to be alive is in this generation right now that we are in. We are living in the most horrific generation for males because males are in turmoil. What do we mean by historical men's problems? First of all, let me give you some history. Historically speaking, and now when I use the word historically speaking, I want you to think about your great-great-grandfather. Can you do that for me? Okay, the one you didn't know. Historically speaking, your great-grandfather and your grandfather are now going to talk about them. And maybe even your father, depending on how old you are. If you are 40 to 50 years old today in this room, I am talking about your father right now. Your father, first of all, used to risk his life to provide. In other words, going to work was a risk. The kind of job he did, he wasn't sure he was coming home safe. Probably works in a coal mine or works in a cotton field. He works in a, in a diamond mine or he works in a tractor or something. In other words, the, the work that a man did was always risky. Therefore, he, he, the focus was on being a good hunter. You see, when you go into history in the caveman, which is, again, your granddaddy was like a caveman. The caveman always used to be the guy who went out to go hunting, and his focus was being a good hunter. He had to train to be a good hunter. So your grandfather trained to be a good worker. He wanted to get a trade. Everybody say trade. That's why your granddaddy wasn't too concerned about education. He wanted a trade. He was a hunter. I got to go and hunt for a job. He actually used to say that, didn't he? I'm going hunting for a job. You see, the caveman went hunting to provide for his family. Number three, he felt loved and respected and appreciated because of the risk he took. Every time a man came home from hunting, working hard, he got a kiss from his wife. Why? She knew he had a hard, risky day, therefore, he was respected by the woman because of the risk he took every day to go hunting to make a living. I'm working on history now, hang on. Therefore, the children always bowed when he came in. Why? He was the great provider. And he did it at the expense of his own safety. Number three, he was motivated by what? Food, sex, children, and security. You know, the caveman was only concerned about these four things right here. And your great-granddaddy was only concerned about these four things. Forgetting food, sex, having some children, and securing his family, buying a house and protecting them. That's all the man thought about. So his focus was very simple. And number four, number five rather, his role was simply to be what? Say it loud. Provider and what? protector that's all it took to be a male to be a man you provided for your family you protected your family that means you went out you risk your life to get food and you built a house to protect your family you provided the house so once a man provided everything and built a house for his family his wife called him a real man his children called him a real man society called him a real man and if you study history not too long ago you'll discover that your great great granddaddy was called a man even by the neighbors. Why? Because, oh, he's a good man. He provided a house for his wife. He provided food for his children. He provided protection for his kids. That's a real man. So his manhood was measured by what he could do. And number seven, very important, his perspective was partnership. In other words, all he wanted his wife to do was to be a partner. And that word partner, had very little to do with affection, almost zero to do with emotions. It had to do with him having her at home while he's out working. I go to risk my life, you protect the house. That's the partnership. I buy the food, you cook it. That's the partnership. I, I give you a sperm, you produce the kids and feed them. That's the partnership. Don't expect nothing else from me. So we are partners. Now that partnership worked very well. But the woman also had a perfect balance in this deal. 
first of all, the woman felt loved and respected because every time he came home, food was cooked. Children were in bed sleeping, not disturbing him. The house was clean. So the man respected the woman because she was a perfect partner. Number two, she gave birth and she nurtured the children. So he respected and loved her. And also she raised the kids and created a home while he was out risking his life to buy the house and pay for the food. So the woman had a perfect job and the man had a perfect job and they knew each other's roles and those roles never collided. Therefore the woman was honored by the man because he knew he couldn't be out risking his life at the same time bringing the kids up, cooking food and cleaning house. So the man did his part, the woman did her part. There was a perfect partnership based on roles. What were the implications? Listen carefully men. Number one, your grandfather lived in a hostile environment. Every time he went out, women had to pray for him to come back. A lot of men never came back. They died on the job. When a hunter goes out to hunt in the wild and leave the wives in the, in the village, the wives had to hope they come back because the wild beasts might kill them. And this, that was true in our society. When a man went out to, to work, he could catch tuberculosis in the coal, in the coal mines. He could actually fall off a tractor and die. In other words, he was out there risking his life. Life was hostile. Number two, his focus was survival and protection. Number three, the male risks his life for food and protection. Number four, he did not need good communication skills. Your grandfather did not talk much to your grandmother. You check it. His conversation was very limited. Where's the food? <laughs> Woman, I need sex. <laughs> There was no foreplay. Caveman came, Jane, boom, 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 finish, sleep. <laughs> Caveman. That's the way your granddaddy was. So he didn't need to learn to communicate because his wife didn't demand it. She knew that he was working. 18 hours a day, he was tired. She knew that. She knew he was risking his life, that she was, she, that he was stressed out. So she would have the food ready, have the hot pan with hot water to put his feet in. She'd have his newspaper ready. She would make sure the kids go to sleep, don't bother him. Why? Because that was her hardworking, risky caveman. She cared for him and he was her giant of provider. So she didn't want to even talk. Matter of fact, your grandfather, my father's and grandmother's house was very quiet. There was no need for communication. I'm talking about history now, watch this. Number five, surviving was difficult, but relationships were comparatively easy. Why? Because the woman knew her job and the man knew her job, his job. The man knew I go to get the bacon, woman knows I cook it. The man knows I build a house, the woman knows I make it a home. Very simple. The man knows I give you children, the woman knows I nurture them. The man knows I bring home the money, the woman knows you manage it. So there was very easy relationships. It was simple for my grandmother and my father, grandfather to live together. Matter of fact, my father and mother was a part of this historical environment. I've never seen my mother and father slap, hit, curse or speak harder one another. Why? Because they were part of this generation. My father worked, my mother stayed at home. Father built a house, mama made it a home. Daddy bought home the food, mama made it a meal. No conflict of roles. It was easy to be a man. As a matter of fact, the way you measured manhood in those days was you build a house and you buy the food. So you are a man. Even if you were shacking up and sleeping around, if you still built a house, and bought the food. They still say, yeah, but he's, he, but he's still a good man. Am I right? Why? He built the house. He bought him the food. Manhood was easy. But here's a difficult one. Men and women existed in different spheres. Simple to be a man back then. And number, and number seven, they depended on each other in order to survive. My mother needed my father. To bring home the bacon, to buy the house, to buy the clothing. She depended on him and my father needed my mother to keep the house, 
to cook the food, to clean the clothes. So there was a perfect dependency which created perfect partnership and it didn't need to be built on love. This is very important. I'm telling you the life of a man just 40 years ago. What were the implications of this lifestyle? Number one, basic needs required specific roles and skills. So once a woman knew how to sew, she was a good woman. And a man knew how to make money and buy a house, he was a good, he was a good man. So the roles are very simple. Number two, there was a natural separation of roles. A man know what a man's supposed to do, a woman know what a woman's supposed to do, so to be a man was easy, just do what males do. Then you are a man. If you are a woman, you do what women do, you are a woman. So you sew the clothes, you cook the food, you clean the house, you are a good woman. You buy the house, you bring home the food, and you protect the kids, you are a good man. Very simple roles, they know it. So a woman says, that's a real man. A man would say, she's a real woman. They knew who each other was. Now listen carefully. Roles were determined by biology. In other words, once you are a male, there are certain things you're not supposed to do, like play with dolls. See, the roles are very simple. Once you are a female, you ain't supposed to play with tractors. So just being born decided your roles. If you are a male, you're supposed to learn a trade. If you are a woman, you got to learn to sew. So every woman had to learn to sew, learn to cook, learn to clean. Every man had to learn a trade, go to work, and learn to build a house. So the roles were all laid out even by their biology. It was easy to be a man. Stay with me. The partnership in survival produced an interdependence that gender generated a mutual respect and appreciation of each other. In other words, the, the male respected the woman because she cooked, she cleaned, she sold, and she nurtured. He respected her. He respected her. I didn't say he loved her. He respected her because of what she brought to the partnership. A woman respected the man because he built the house. He bought the food. He made sure they were protected. He did what's supposed to He kept the lights on. He kept the water running. So she respected him as a man. So the respect was mutual. It was easy to be respected. We got a problem now with what I call the tra traditional roles of men. Here's a question. Is a man still supposed to be the breadwinner and the protector? Things have been distorted now. Number two. Is a man still the leader and authority in the home? Do you know why your grandfather was the head of the home? Because he bought it. Stay with me. Very serious, Bishop. Do you know why your grandfather was respected in the house? Because he paid for it. Do you know why he was the head of the house? Because it was his house. In other words, he was head, not because they voted. He was head because of what he did. Follow me now. This is going to get deep in a minute. So a man was a man because of what he did. The question is, is a man still the head and the leader of the house? Very important question. And is the man still the breadwinner and the protector? Your grandfather's and your father's life has been completely destroyed. Case in point, when you meet a woman today, she already got a house. Can we talk just a couple minutes? <laughs> she got a house. Secondly, she making more than you. Let's not talk about bread now. Mm-hmm. And she don't need her protection. She got mace. So everything that made your father a man has been canceled. Are you getting it? That's why you're confused. So when you meet a woman today, and a woman says, be a man, you go into confusion. Because your father says, yes, boy, put your foot down. And you know, <laughs> and you say, but dad, it ain't my floor. <laughs> Come on, let's talk. 
son, if you bring home the bacon, you got a right to demand that she cook it. Dad, she owned the pig. So everything that made him a man doesn't exist for you. That's why you're having problems with the woman in your life. And what makes you so depressed and frustrated and stressed out is that she keeps on telling you, be a man, be a man. And you don't know how to be it because what made your father a man doesn't exist and you keep trying to find what your father had. Are you still the leader in the house? Well, the question is, is it your house? I'm working it. <laughs> See, and men are going through problems and they don't understand what happened. Everything went crazy. I'm going to show you in a minute how, how we got like this. Number three, is a man still the show to show chivalry? In other words, you know, your grandfather, your mother waited for him to open the door. Why? That's what men do. It was a role for a man. Your, your, your mother waited for your father to pull the chair out. Why? That's what men do. Today, the women you know, you open the door for them, you, you, are you, am I crippled or something? Am I crippled? I don't need to open the door for me. You pull the chair out. What you pull that chair out for? I don't need no man to pull the chair out for me. Your grandfather, when he took your grandmother out, there was no question who paid for the meal. Chivalry. But today, you take a woman out, she got more money than you, and she say, order what you want. <laughs> so now you're confused. How do I be a man with this woman? I go home to a house that ain't mine. I drive a car that ain't mine. I open a refrigerator that ain't mine. I turn the TV on that ain't mine. Plasma flat screen. And I got a bank account that ain't mine. And she still says, be a man. Stay with me. Bishop and I are gonna help you all this week. I say, you gonna get some help this week. Number four, very important, is a man still the defender and the protector of his family and property? You know, your grandfather, I mean, the minute he came home, everybody ran. Why? He was the protector, the head of the house. If anybody touched his family, he would go into action. Your, your grandmother felt safe when your father, grandfather was around. Today, a woman doesn't need you to protect her anymore. She carry a gun in her purse, you know, Madea. She got a mace in a pocketbook. So you don't need to protect a woman anymore. She got her own car with her own electric, you know, windows. She got a cell phone with 911. She don't need you to be a man to protect her anymore. So now you feel helpless. This last one is important. Write this down. Men don't know if women need them anymore. And that's what you're struggling with right now. And you feel useless. How do we get like this? Now, what could be worse than a man not feeling valuable anymore? The result is an angry male. And that's why prison is filled with them. Do you know why a man would slap a woman? Because he doesn't know what to do. See, 99% of the men in this room are angry, but they are suppressing it. We are angry at a society who messed us up and didn't tell us how to be a man. The society destroyed all of what made our father a man and didn't give us a replacement. So your woman tells you, be a man, and you go, okay. Uh, I'm going to build you a house. She says, I already got a house. He says, okay, uh, I'll give you some money. 
She said, I got more than you. Okay, I'll bring on the bacon. She said, I already got the pig. Okay, I'll protect you. I got my gun already. Okay, I'll pull the chair out for you. I go to the gym. I got muscles. I can do it myself. Okay, uh, 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 then she says, be a man. Okay, uh, and then she says, be a man. And you go, because the only thing you got left is your strength. Domestic violence is a result of angry men who are suppressing their anger because society have destroyed all that made them man. And that's why you have difficulty finding a woman. You are intimidated by every woman you meet. You got a high school diploma, she got a PhD, and right away, you got problems. She drives a BMW, you got yourself a Toyota and a <coughs> Honda. And she says, be a man. She takes you to her deep apartment. And so you're confused. So we live in a new world. How many of you are learning something already? I know how you feel right now. That's why you're quiet. I know. See, we have to deal with the, the problems first and describe them and define them first. And then we're going to correct them before you leave this retreat. I promise you will get answers in this place this week. Life has changed for the male. As a matter of fact, we are no longer utterly dependent on each other for security and survival because the rules have changed. My mother and my father depended on each other to survive. Do you know why my mother and father never got a divorce? 51 years of marriage. Do you know why? Because she couldn't afford it. She lived in his house. She ate his food. She slept in his bed. She drank his water. She put on his lights. How could she leave him? That's why your great-grandmother and great-grandfather never got a divorce. They depended on each other to survive. Your father never left her. Your grandfather never left her. Why? He needed someone to keep that house, to cook that food, to, to, to clean those kids. So he needed her. But today, no woman needs you to survive. You meet them richer than you. So you, you know, you, you, I can hear you telling your wife, if you don't behave, I'm going to leave. She go, go, this is my house. <laughs> so you say, I ain't giving you no more money. She says, what you got is mine. See, you, you don't need each other. And so your manhood is being completely disrupted. Most men live in fear that the woman they are with could leave them and never miss them. How's that for security? I'm sure glad you're here, man. We're going to help you, okay? Am I describing your experience? Come on, be honest. I know you don't want to say it, but it's true. The average man is struggling with a woman who's smarter than him, make more than him, owns more than him, before he even meets her. And how do you be a man with that? Maybe that's why most men who are frustrated go with prostitutes. Because she ain't own nothing. She got to depend on his $20. So he feels like a man when he pays her. Oh, I don't want to touch this stuff. Man, I feel an anointing in this place. See, your struggle is real. Your struggle came from 
the historical convulsion and no one told you so here you are in church loving God and still can't find a woman who you're safe with she sings in the choir but she can leave you in the morning and never miss you so you don't feel like a man Here's a statement I wrote this out of my book. Please get a copy of it. It says, for the first time in recorded history, we look to each other primarily for love and romance, and not survival. And that's the biggest change of all. Write that down. It's very important. See, your grandfather and grandmother did not look to each other for romance and love. They had a partnership. <laughs> I build a house, you keep it. I buy the food, you cook it. That was it. There was no love and romance in your grandfather and grandmother's relationship. That's why he never took her out for dinner every week. There was no flowers coming home to your great-grandmother from your great-grandfather. They didn't buy gifts on Valentine. They were too busy surviving. But you see, today, you got a woman who don't need you to survive. So she's not looking for a house anymore. Listen to me, brothers. She ain't looking for no car or no money anymore. She's looking for something that you ain't trained to give her. And what is it? Romance and love. And you ain't trained to give her that. So what do you do? You buy her a gift. And she said, that's not what I want. I got money. You buy a ring. She says, I could buy a ring more expensive than that. Why well, I don't want your ring. She wants romance and you ain't equipped. Your grandfather and grandmother didn't have time for romance. He was so tired when he came home, he collapsed. And she was so tired when he came home, she was glad. But today, both of you out working, both come at 5, and you got from 5 p.m. to 5 a.m., a whole lot of time, what do you do? So she says, you don't talk to me. <laughs> Listen, the only sound a caveman makes is this. <laughs> so when you come home, you go... <laughs> And she goes, I want conversation. And because you're not trained, you turn the TV on and hide behind the game. I got you, yeah. And what does she want? She says, turn the TV off. And you're like, it'll be too quiet. Why? I don't know how to romance you. I'm not trained. My father didn't have the equipment to train me to romance a woman. And then she says, I want love. Oh, no, that's worse. So you figure love, okay, let's go to bed. Bam! He said, no, she said, no, 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 no. That's not love. I want you to touch me without sex. And, he, <laughs> and you go, are you crazy, woman? That's why it's so tough for a man to be a man in this century because everything has been destroyed that made him a man so for the first time in history a man and a woman live together not for survival and that's tough because your father taught you to survive and what your woman wants is romance Write this down, very important. Happiness, intimacy, and lasting passion are now requirements for relationships. And that's tough for the 21st century male. He doesn't know how to, pro to provide that. Passion, happiness. Happiness for your grandfather was bringing the money home. For your wife today, she got more money than you. So happiness doesn't come from money for her anymore. Your grandmother was happy because your grandfather bought the house. Today, 
The woman who you meet owns the house, so you can't make her happy by a house. How do you make a woman happy today? And that's why men are frustrated, because they don't know how to make a woman happy anymore. It's tough. And so we come to church, we stand together and we sing. And then we drive home, all the way home quiet. Because we don't know what to say. We'd rather speak to God than one another. We're not trained to be the kind of man that a woman is demanding today. We need conferences like this to talk about these things and then we need some sessions for training. Oh, please. We need some training. You see, because your father, I told you your father couldn't tell, teach you. Because your father's information is irrelevant. God would raise a Bishop Jakes to have manpower to put the power back in manhood. Because the power has been destroyed by the change in our social structure. And we can't get it from the social structure anymore. We got to get it from the manual for man. It's the word of the living God. <laughs> Say amen, somebody. Amen. Tell your neighbor, where was this guy all my life? I was in the Bahamas. <laughs> Here's the conclusion of the matter. The impact of all that change is simple, and that is over the last 40 years, one generation, the traditional male and female roles have changed, and that's what you're suffering from. The crisis is your roles don't make you a man anymore. And that's tough. So being married is stressful. Because you go home to a house that you don't know what to do with, and half of it ain't yours. <laughs> That's tough. You sitting at the food, at the table eating food, and you know that half of this food ain't yours. So you're afraid to correct people in the house. Oh man, it's tough being a man. You are afraid to tell somebody to hurry up and cook. Because you know they could say, I went to work also. Oh, <laughs> it's tough. Times have changed. Everybody say, Times have changed. Time Tell your brother, Times have changed. Time change. But I'm going to get help right here this week. <laughs> Clap your hands. You believe that in all your heart. You're going to get help here this week. We brought you here not to harass you, but to help you. Write this down. Women are leaving the home and entered the work workplace. That's the first thing that happened. Number two, this diminished men's traditional value to women. This is a very important statement. Do you know when this all happened? It started in the 1940s. During World War II, in the Western world for the first time, there was a world war that affected the Western world, where you and I live. The world war that was started by Germany, hit England, spread throughout Europe, and then they bombed Pearl Harbor, and they drew the Americas in. Listen to me carefully, please. This is, this is very important historically. So you have a war that made the American society have to respond. So America, and the Caribbean, including where I'm from, because we were under the British, they took the men and shipped them off to Europe to fight the Germans. Watch this. So guess who stayed at home? The women. Now watch this. So you had all these hundreds of thousands of men going to Europe on ships and planes and barges, leaving the farms, leaving the pharmacies, leaving the factories, leaving the houses, and they went away for weeks and months and years. And the women, therefore, had to take over the factories. So the women in America began to be called to make butter, to make bullets, 
to make tanks. And if you go in your library right now in Texas and look up the history of what happened during the war, you will discover that the women kept the machinery of the war running while the men were on the battlefield. Which means that the woman who used to cook the food, take care of the kids, was now learning to operate a machine, make bullets, develop products, drive a tractor. Now, the war lasted over four or five years. When the men came back, I'm trying to give you what happened. When they came back, the factories were already occupied. When they came back, the machines were being run by the women. So World War II destroyed the culture. And the men came back, and the women picked them up in a truck, and she never used to drive. He had to cook his own food because she had to go to the factory. And now she was getting paid, not waiting for him to bring home the bacon. And that's where you came from today. Everything changed. Now this statement is very important, what I have here. This diminished the man's traditional value to women. See, your grandmother esteemed your grandfather highly because she needed him. He was valuable because she needed him to survive. The woman that you're with now, the value she put on you is so low that if you leave, she'll keep going. She'll take a lick it, keep on taking. And that's why men like you and me, we are so afraid of these women because our value is so low in their eyes. I mean, you meet her and she got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, a PhD, and you have a certificate from a junior college. And right away you begin to feel intimidated, afraid, you become insecure. Why? Because the value is so low. It started from World War II and we're still suffering from it. I guess my point is you have to, in this conference, Stop getting your manhood from what you do. Listen, I've been married for 27 years, and my wife and my kids got no questions about who's the head of the house. It has nothing to do with the house. There was a time when my wife used to work for an oil company, I worked for the government. She made twice my salary. I was still the head of the house. <laughs> Why? It ain't got to do with money. Nothing to do with money. Women are becoming independent, self-sufficient. And so the women today no longer feel that they need men. Do you know a few of them? I said, do you know a few of those women? Yeah, they live right where you live. Some live in your house. See, they have this attitude. If you don't like it, you could go. That's what they say. This attitude. You met me with what I have, you could leave me with what I have, they say. That's why these marriages don't work, because they began with insecurity and fear. They call it prenuptial agreements. It's satanic. But it's the result of our environment. You come to her with your high school diploma. She come to you with her PhD. So she said, before we get married, let me protect my PhD. Sign here. That's not love, that's an arrangement. A 
What do we do? We are living in a time of dramatic transition, sexual tension. And that's what you feel right now as a man. It's tough to be with a woman for more than an hour. The tension is so high. Think about it a minute. Including your wife. To be in a room with no radio on, no television on, and just sitting there is hard work for a man. Attention. How do we get like this? I'm not finished, but I got to wrap up and take a break for this evening. But let me just give you these last thoughts to write down. And tomorrow morning, uh, we are going to deal with how to bring this together to find your manhood. You're going to be so excited when you get the revelation tomorrow. God's going to deliver you from the fear of women. <laughs> write these statements down, please. Here's the male challenge of the 21st century. And it took me 30 years of research to figure this out. And in those five books I talked about earlier, if you want to get that whole pack, these are critical because your grandchildren need you to get your head together. I'm talking about the ones who are unborn. Number one, number one challenge of the male. Men no longer have the job they held for centuries. We lost our jobs. We are no longer the provider. We are no longer the protector. We are no longer the supplier. We lost our jobs. Number two, men are no longer valued and appreciated as providers and protectors. We're not appreciated anymore. And when appreciation falls, respect goes with it. And repeat myself. When appreciation falls, respect goes with it. So men are not appreciated anymore like they used to be. And number three, their traditional role is not enough to make their partner happy anymore. Even buying gifts could cause an argument today. Why you buy this for me? This is so cheap. I could have buy something better than this for myself. Because she has the buying power. You bring a gift home for your wife and it becomes an argument. So what do you do? You leave the house? and start getting upset, angry, go down the street, sit on the bar stool and get drunk. Why? You need peace in your mind. Or you go to another woman who lies to you. And you feel safer there because she tells you how wonderful you are. Some of you are wondering, how can an old man in the choir who has been there for 30 years leave his wife of 50 years and marry a young girl? Because he's been surviving in his marriage. And the young girl lied to him and said, I need you. And it's enough. He feels appreciated. He's gone. Let me tell you something. We need to have, oh dear Bishop, my great friend, beloved, another conference just for women to teach them how to live with a man like us. Come on, clap, man. The average woman don't know how to live with a man like you because you are an awesome man. My wife is the smartest woman in the world. <laughs> she got a college degree, everything else. She act like she ain't got nothing. <laughs> so what I did, I wrote my wife's boss her resignation letter. I said, you ain't working for nobody else. So my wife was enjoying everything. She got her own bank account. And my wife acting like she ain't got nothing. She just, 
She said, honey, just go ahead, do whatever you want to do. I said, what do you want? She said, anything you want to buy me. She's a wise woman. And number four, today's women require something more than her mother required. And that's the challenge of a man. It was easy for your father to make your mother happy. But you got a problem. How many times have the men around you said, what else do I need to do to make this woman happy? And you are correct. It's a good question. And so men resort to violence to relent their pet up anger. And the average man in here who may have been domestically abusive hates the fact that he is, but doesn't know why. It keeps exploding. That's why God brought you to this conference. We're going to defuse the pressure cooker in the next two days. You're going to be a free man before you leave this retreat. Stand up on your feet. Tell your brother, I'm just like you. I got problems too. But we're going to get answers here this week. Just hold right here. Hold your brother's hand. I want to pray a special prayer. Hallelujah. Look at me. Brothers, look at me. You can switch the screen again, tech guys. Listen. You know everything I said is true. And you're quietly sitting there thinking, how did he figure all of that out? The answer is, because I had to deal with it too. And I overcame it. And that's why we're here. We come as a team to work with you as men. Because you have to become a new kind of man. Some of you are pastors, and you're just as bad as your members. Same problems, hiding behind the pulpit. Listen, we got to deal with this, and we got to correct it, and get some answers from this book. Tonight at 7 o'clock, Bishop is going to pick up on part two. Because the feelings that you go through in this session today need some relief the Holy Spirit is here and he has a way of doing surgery and you feel it don't you he goes on the inside and he cuts things out first he's exposing some hurts that you didn't know you even had but he never opens you up without a plan to close you up he's gonna bring healing to you there's a power here right now. I feel it all over this place. There's an anointing in this place to heal the brokenhearted man. You've been frustrated. Some of you got some memories you wish you could forget. You hurt a lot of women. And you probably understand why now. Some even hate your mother. Struggles with your mom struggles with your your ex-wife and now you got a new wife and you got still struggles because you can't find better people you got to become a better person hallelujah help us Lord Jesus cares so much about you that he called this conference for men only. Your, your struggles for manhood I promise you, 
I promise you with so much conviction that your struggles for manhood ends in this weekend. I am sure of it. Thank you, Lord. Lift those hands up right where you are. Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I need help. I need to understand what happened to me. And I need to understand what to do about it. I submit to you. I submit to your word. I submit to your spirit. Change me. It's already begun. 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 Come on, lift those voices and give him praise. Worship him wherever you are. God bless you. Come on, brothers, give it up for Dr. Miles Monroe. session that I did some months ago in Tulsa, Oklahoma. He was there and uh, I did a session on the kingdom of God and he caught the vision. He caught the message. Let's hold hands together. Prepare our hearts for the word of God. Amen. Are you ready? Are you sure? I am so proud of uh, this great conference because so many men have said to me, how blessed they've been already and uh, thank you so much for allowing us to serve you uh, tonight is going to be a rough ride but it's going to be a good ride because we're going to give some answers this morning is that all right i uh i thank god for bishop td jakes i know we we, we we say this a lot but you know he is one of the greatest gifts god gave our generation and I think we ought to just thank God for him. I said thank God for T.D. Jakes. Are you all ready? Yeah. Let's hold hands together. Tell your neighbor, if you knew, if you knew how, rich how rich I was going to become, you would take me for lunch today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely. You don't know who you're standing next to. You really don't. Praise God. Thanks. Let's hold hands together and pray. The word of God says, wherever any two shall touch and agree. Let's obey that word right now and hold hands with your brother. Your brother needs you. Uh, when our meeting ended last night, Bishop Jake said, and he kept repeating it. It's a very important statement. Strengthen your brother. I mean, that men are so isolated. we won't open ourselves sometimes to let our brothers strengthen us and so we need to stand together holding hands doesn't mean you are a sissy that's why Christ loved to touch people all the time because they need encouragement they need the strength of one another and we need to strengthen each other amen let's pray father thank you for your word thank you for your to be with us forever 
Thank you for giving us your word that is our compass and our life. Help us to feed on your word today. And may your name be glorified. May your kingdom come in our midst today. Thank you again for your presence here and your promise that when we come together in your name, you are there in the midst, not to entertain us, but to bless us. So I ask you to permanently damage our ignorance. By the power of your revelation knowledge, I submit myself to you again. I cannot teach. I can only talk. You are the teacher. And you said we need no man to teach us, for there is an anointing that teaches us. Let that spirit teach every hearer. Not only those in this building, but those who will listen to these CDs and, and DVDs. Lord, change thousands of men's lives beyond this place and begin it with us. And don't challenge us, change us. Don't entertain us, Father, but transform us by the renewing of our minds that we might know what is your perfect will. In Jesus' name, everybody say amen. amen. Well, you may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm coming on, I promise. Tony Mason, who just sung, is one of my sons in the faith. And uh, he is probably one of the most biblical writers of music that I know. His songs are not written to appeal to entertainment, but to instruction. And if there's anything I'd like to encourage you to do is to get one of his CDs out there. He's a tremendous writer. Most of the teachings that I have taught, he captured them in song, and that's what's on his CD. So I want to recommend you do that. And uh, I'm going to just give these two away here. Tony, if you don't mind, I'm going to give these to the bishop so that he can really hear your music in his, his SUV. <laughs> Uh, Tony is offering a special on the CDs out there, he said, so make sure, grab those. And uh, can I give somebody this? Don't hurt yourself. Wow! Give him a hand. He plays football. Gosh, he's good. Get your notebooks, please. And let's go to work. I want to thank Dr. Bishop T.D. Jakes for the privilege of being here. He can invite anyone to speak to these conferences, and I'm sure many people will want the opportunity. I'm busy, and he's busy, and all of us are busy, but uh, when I considered this invitation, when I got the letter, Jamal gave me the, uh, uh, a phone call just to check to see if I got it. And uh, on my desk, I had about 15 other invitations, and uh, many of them are in places where I would like to be countries where my heart is, in the third world nations, but the Holy Spirit told me that I must come to this one because of the men. So I'm here uh, because God wanted me to be here. Thank you so much for the privilege. I don't take this lightly, and I am honored to be here. Uh, this is part two. So we can switch the screens, brothers, and let's go to work. Uh, many of you men picked up some materials yesterday and that was so encouraging to me because men don't read too much and I see that you were investing in yourself by obtaining those books and CDs and DVDs yesterday I hope all of you in this room would get a copy of He Motions I recommend that you shouldn't leave here without that book as a matter of fact I would like to suggest that that book becomes your textbook for this conference, uh, written by Dr. T.D. Jakes. Get a copy of that book, don't, and don't just take one for yourself, but take one home for maybe your uncle or your father or your son or your brother. 
uh, invest in someone else too. It's a fantastic book. I recommend it. I think that uh, we need books that can help men get instruction. And I encourage you to make sure you don't leave here without that book, He Motions by T.D. Jakes. I read it and it inspired me, impacted me, and encouraged me. And I'm, and I'm stealing some stuff from it anyhow too. So uh, <laughs> the only problem is when I preach it, it sounds better than when he preaches it. So. <laughs> But make sure I get a copy of that. It's a powerful book. Uh, the book that I want to recommend, the material I'm teaching you yesterday and today, are from chapter one in this book called Understanding the Purpose for the Male Man. Understanding the Purpose for the Man. This book is, is really a 27-year project for me, working with men over these years. So I want to recommend this book to you, along with the book on women. And the book on women is important because most men don't understand women. And I believe that some of the best books I've found on women are written in our generation by Dr. T.D. Jakes. And I believe that this book would be a good assistance to some of those as well. But this one deals with the five needs of a woman. And uh, in this book, I talk about the fact that the first need of a male is sex. Men don't want sex. <laughs> what happened? Y'all going quiet on me? <laughs> they went into shock just now. The number one need of a male is sex. I didn't say the number one need of a man, because man is a spirit being. He needs God. But the male is the body he lives in. And that body's number one desire is sex. But the number one need of a woman is not sex. It's affection. And sex is not affection. That's why most women are angry after you had a climax. Everybody still here? Do you know why? She's angry because you got your needs met. But she may not have got her needs met because affection is not sex. So that book deals with those issues and the other needs. You can study those and you can have a good relationship with a woman if you understand needs. Uh, this book is a book that I want to recommend to you as well called uh, Living Your Glory how to bring out your real man, your real gift. And uh, this is our best-selling book on prayer. Half a million copies were sold already, and we're still getting an exciting response from the publishers on the power of prayer. I wrote this book because I wasn't getting my prayers answered. The smallest meeting in every church is the prayer meeting. When I discovered the secret of prayer, the Lord began to sh show me how to get answers every time I prayed. I decided to share it with millions of people. So I hope you get a copy of that. Uh, this is the newest book called Understanding Your Potential, re revised version. I recommend it to all of you men. And also The Spirit of Leadership is a book that you definitely want to get along with the book on the kingdom. And this one on the 26th difference between a man and a woman, and that is Love and Marriage. It's a powerful book that I put together from 27 years of teaching on marriage and relationships. And in this book, I talk about the 26 differences between a male and a female. We are completely different. In my devotions this morning, I met with some of our men in my hotel room. We were praying together. And I was sharing with them how different a man is from a woman. And I talk about it in this book. I want to give you one hint of the difference between a man and a woman. And that is, a man is a logical creature. A woman is an emotional feeler. Look at me. I want you to get this. Because a man is a logical thinker, he is completely opposite to a female. A woman feels things. A man thinks things. 
Because of that, a man is a calculator. He calculates everything. That's why men do not think on their feet. When a woman asks a man for his opinion, he normally says, I'll tell you later. That's because he needs to calculate. He needs to, to analyze. He needs to think. Women make decisions on the spur of the moment. A man needs a couple of days. He's a logical thinker. Listen. That very thing is his strength. God gave the male the ability to be logical by nature because he was designed to be the leader of the family. And to be a leader, you can't be emotional. You have to think, calculate. You have to assess, analyze. So you as a male and me as a male, we are not living on feelings. We don't live on feelings. We live on our logic. That's a strength for a male because of his position. But it's also his weakness. That is why most men are unfaithful to their wives. Let me explain why men are normally unfaithful. Because a man, because he's logical, he has to live on decisions. A woman, because she's emotional, she lives on feelings. So a man lives by what he decides to do. A woman lives by what she feels. So a man is motivated by decision. A woman is motivated by fear. This is very important to hear this. This is why a woman will be thinking about committing adultery, but she'll be afraid to do it because she feels that it's not right. A man, on the other hand, is opposite to that. When a man has an opportunity to commit adultery, he calculates it. I got you, I know. And because he's logical, he actually logically analyzes how he can get away with it. And his plan is so tight that when he has finished planning it, he knows, I can do this. So a man is not motivated. I'm going to say something very important here. Write this down by fear. A man is not motivated by fear. He's motivated by logic. So he's motivated by his decisions. This is why you will never feel like you should be faithful to your wife. You'll never feel that. Because you don't operate on feelings. You will never feel that you got to be faithful to a woman. Therefore, the only way for a man to be faithful to his wife and to his children is a decision. I am telling you the most important thing you ever heard about faithfulness. Faithfulness doesn't have a feeling. There's no feelings in faithfulness. And the Bible never tells a woman to be faithful. I can't find it in the Bible. It keeps telling the male to be faithful because he's logical. So every day, you have to decide to be married. I'm giving you advice to protect your wife. 
You will never feel married. Write that down. A male will never feel married. Because we are logical. You have to decide to be married. So you can't feel that you have a day when you stop being tempted by women. It will never go away. You got to decide you don't want them. All right, I'm trying to give you advice. Let me tell you how dangerous logic is for us as men. Even when a man makes a mistake, he can calculate how to explain it to the point where he believes it. <laughs> that is why when you committed adultery, you violated the marriage vow. By the time you was finished explaining it to your wife, she felt like she caused it. Because you calculated, you were logical on every point. You told her, when I wanted sex, you didn't give it to me. Every time I come home, you sleeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you calculated the whole thing, explained it to her, and then she began to believe it herself. It's getting quiet early in the morning. All the men lift their right hand. If you're sure you are a male, lift your right hand. Repeat after me. In the name of Jesus, I will make the right decisions from this day forward. Amen. You got to decide to be faithful. All right. I want to to just pick up where we left off yesterday. And I want you to write these statements down. We're talking about the purpose for the male man. The first statement is that men work harder than their forefathers, and yet they cannot feel the pride of being the provider and the protector. And that's where we ended last night, yesterday rather, that men have lost the privilege that their fathers had. The privilege of being respected and honored by the women and the children in their lives. Number two, men feel underpaid, defeated, and unappreciated, and that makes them angry. Most men feel unappreciated and underpaid, and that frustrates them. Point number three, men deal with the toll of two career marriages and what it takes on them. I think the toughest thing for a man sitting in your chair right now is the fact that the house that your grandfather had is not the house you live in now. Your grandfather came home to his wife. You come home to your house because she's working also. So the home that your grandfather had is not your home, and that's tough. So it's difficult for you to tell your wife, where's my food? Because she's also making the bacon. And so you're frustrated. Point number four, men compete with women for positions at home and work. Some women make more money than their, how, their, their spouses, their husbands, and therefore the men are afraid to talk in the house. The job used to be to the male that he's in charge because he bought home the bacon. But that position is now in question. It used to be that the women used to be the one in the kitchen. Today we're not sure who's supposed to be in the kitchen. Sometimes the logic is whoever comes home first starts cooking. There's nowhere in scripture where it says a woman's place is in the kitchen. It's not scriptural. As a matter of fact, my studies of the Bible shows me something shocking, and that is the, the, the cooks in the Bible were, were men. 
<laughs> I remember, you know, when, when a man is about to die, whatever he asks for got to be the best. What do you think? If he's on his dying bed, right? I'll never forget that the patriarch, Isaac, when he's about to die, decided he wanted to eat his last meal. And he didn't ask for his wife to cook it. <laughs> he wanted his son to cook it. He said, cook that porridge that you cook all the time, that good one. In other words, the men cooked a lot in scripture. So if you want to be a good man of God, you got to learn to cook. How many of you men would like to be like Jesus? Let me see your hands. Are you sure? Okay, Jesus Christ was a cook. The Bible says one day when he rose from the dead, the disciples were out in the boat and they were fishing and they caught nothing. And he came walking on the water. He was on the shore. He saw them and he knew they caught anything. They didn't catch anything. So the Bible says he got a fish and he cooked it. You still want to be like Jesus? But men and women are competing for positions and the roles have been changing now here's what i want you to get this morning the male defined his identity through the roles he performed in society and that's where most men get their identity from by what they do secondly the male defined his manhood by the roles he performed historically that is a reality and thirdly if identity and value are defined by roles, then the loss of roles is the loss of identity and self-worth. Please get this CD, listen to it again. I'm going to say it again. If you got your identity and your value from things you do, then when the things you do are destroyed, then your identity is gone and your value, your self-worth is also gone. And so you end up being nobody. And most males are in that state right now. They're not sure what to do to be a man anymore because the roles have gone that made them a man. So you have to get to the point where your manhood has nothing to do with the roles you perform. Making the most money in the family doesn't make you the head of the house anymore. Because you don't make the most money in most cases. Owning the house doesn't make you the male man head of the home anymore. Because in most cases, the woman either owns half of it or all of the house. So that's destroyed. And so the average male cannot find his male manhood identity because he doesn't know what makes him a man anymore. Everything is gone. And that's why most of you, like I was, you're struggling with what does it mean to be a man. You live with a woman who has a PhD. She makes $600,000 a year. She owns the house you live in. She bought you your car and the TV is hers and you got to be a man in that house. That's tough. And the woman you're going with right now picks you up in her car. <laughs> Pays for your meals. I mean, this is tough. And you're thinking about marrying that thing. That's intimidating. That's fearful. So your identity is gone when the roles are gone. What's the result of this conflict? Number one, write this down, please. Number one is the loss of a sense of purpose. Males have lost a sense of purpose there's no meaning in their lives anymore number two the loss of identity they're not sure what it is to be a man anymore number three the loss of self-worth they don't feel valuable anymore number four the loss of self-esteem they don't feel that they are in high estimation among women anymore and number five a loss of value they don't feel valuable to the marriage and to the women and to the children anymore it's amazing how many men would walk out of their families and leave their wife and kids and the wife just keeps on trucking. And she brings the kids up by herself. And then the kids graduate from college and the guy comes around at the graduation walking real cool. 
never bought him up, never paid anything, but he showed the graduation and he wants to take pictures with the kids. And the kids look at him as if he ain't worth nothing because where were you for the last 10 years, sir? See, and they began to lower your value because you lose that when you lose your value to the family. Number six, the result is the man lost a, a sense of clear expectations. When you don't know what's expected of you, you become frustrated. And number seven, a loss of spiritual compass. When a man loses his identity and his value, his spiritual compass goes out of whack. So he doesn't know how to be a spiritual leader anymore because he has no value. If there's one thing a male needs, it's respect. The only problem is our society have destroyed everything that gave the male respect. Remember I told you yesterday that a man was respected because he bought the house. The man was respected because he bought the food. He was respected because he took care of the kids. He's respected because he paid the bills. But today, the woman owns the house, buys the food, pays the bills, and brings up the kids without you. So what is she going to respect you for? And that's why most of us in this room are frustrated because a woman talks down on us and talks down at us because she doesn't see us as valuable anymore. As a matter of fact, most women tolerate men. And men know it. And it's frustrating. Number eight, a loss of a sense of authority. When your identity is gone, your worth is gone, your value is gone, and your esteem is gone, then your authority left with it. You have no authority in the house, no authority among your kids. And that's why your kids talk back at you. 14-year-old will curse you in the face. And you say, I'm your daddy. I know you're my daddy, but you ain't living here. See, there's no authority. You tell your kids, if you don't behave, I'll put you out. This is my mama's house, not yours. See, your authority is gone. The whole thing is messed up. I'm going to help you before you leave. Number nine, a loss of self-pride. And that's the worst thing that can happen to a human is when you lose your pride. And most men, the one sitting behind you right now, is struggling with a loss of pride. He has very little to be proud of. Let me tell you what makes a man feel like a king. When a woman begins to say to him how wonderful he is. It takes a queen to make a man a king. But the problem is the queen curses the king. She devalues the king. So the man is suffering from a lack of pride. I mean, what is there for you to be proud of right now? Think about it in your environment. What is there to be proud of? The house ain't yours. Her car is her own. She got her own bank account. She got her own job. She got promoted twice ahead of you. What do you come home and tell her? Honey, I just got $50,000 raised. No. Very little to be proud of. And so you, you find that your manhood is constantly being eroded by the environment of our social structure. And number 10, and this is the most important one, the loss of passion. When a man loses a reason for getting up in the morning, you got yourself a dying society. No more passion in the male. That's why the males are in gangs or they're drunk on the streets. That's why most men are on drugs. There's no reason for living anymore. They lost it because everything that made them important is gone. So they say, I might as well just chunk it. So they take drugs, they drink alcohol, they, they have sex with prostitutes. They just kind of throw it up. He said, but brother, you got a good family. Yeah, but they don't respect me. So I'm sleeping around. Hey, you got a good family. Yeah, but I'm going to take cocaine because there ain't no reason for me to be around because they don't need me. What do you do with this kind of man? Well, here's the answer. What's the key to getting your manhood back? Write this down in bold letters, please. 
The key to regaining your manhood is purpose. Sounds very simple, but it's not. As a matter of fact, the key to identity is discovery of purpose. This motorbike gets its identity from the purpose it was made. The purpose for this motorbike creates its identity. The shoe on your feet gets its identity from the purpose it was made. You don't identify your shoe as a shirt. Why? Because it's not made to wear on your back. Please hear me. If you don't get this, you're going to mess up. You're going to mess up, brothers. You don't give this bike purpose. The bike came with purpose. Mm? So a male man cannot get his purpose from his wife. He cannot get his purpose from his job. You don't buy your shoes and then decide, I'm going to put them on my feet. They came with that. You don't make a shoe a shoe. It came a shoe. Oh, I'm talking now. And that's why we're suffering. We are asking the women to make us a man. We asking society to make us a man. We asking our children, make me a man. And God is saying they can make you a man. Your salary can never make you a man. Your job can never make you a man. Your title can never make you a man. If you call this motorbike a boat, it will still be. <laughs> you see, opinion cannot change purpose. I need another session. Bishop, I need another session, I beg, just think about it. Listen, because if people call you names and you accept it, it's evidence that you don't know who you are. Your manhood is not tied to social commentary. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Write this down, number three. You, your masculinity is found in your purpose. It doesn't matter how much money my, my, my wife makes. I am the head of the house. Not because of how much I make or don't make. And I am a masculine man, not because my wife tells me so. Or not because them women you run around with tell you so either. Number four, your value is found in your purpose. Let me tell you something. Do you know why this bike is valuable? Because it gets you through traffic with ease, better than a car. That's why it's so valuable. Your value comes from your purpose. Why is this microphone so valuable? Because 
its purpose is to capture and amplify sound through those speakers. So the value of this microphone is based on the purpose it performs. If I go to your car right now and take the battery out, what happens? It shuts down. So your battery's value is tied to its purpose. Its purpose is to provide power to turn the generator, to turn the engine. If you remove the battery, its purpose ceases, the whole car stops. That means if you take a real man out of the family, Oh, I got Abu Shatamaha. Then the whole family shuts down. The car is still there, but it ain't functioning because the battery that provides the power is gone. When Jesus comes back to earth, the prophet says, he will focus on one thing. He will return the hearts of the fathers back to the family. In other words, the family looks good, but it ain't functioning. Number five, write this down. Your function is found in your purpose. The male must find his purpose. And he cannot get it from a woman. He cannot get it from magazines. He cannot get it from football players. He cannot get it from basketball players. He cannot get it from a sport. He cannot get it from muscles. Your function is found in your purpose. What are you supposed to do is found in your purpose. Let me give you a little example of roles versus purpose how different they are write this down very important and take this back home and teach it to your children pastors please write this down and get, take it to your church and teach it for the whole church let the women hear this number one when roles change so will your identity therefore roles are always temporary you know right now i am performing a role i am teaching from a podium in a, in a little while, I'm going to perform another role. I'll probably go for lunch, so I'll be an eater at a restaurant. And after that, you know, I might sit down with some men and talk. So now I'll be entertaining some. In other words, the roles are always temporary. Right now, you may be making a lot of money, but you may lose your job next month. So if you tied your manner to your job, Man, it is temporary. You're supposed to be a man whether you are broke, ain't got no job, or is a billionaire. Talk to me, somebody. If you took this motorbike and put it in the poorest country in the world, in Haiti, it'll still be a motorbike. Doesn't matter where you put it, it is still what it is. Come on, brother, talk to me. No matter what. <laughs> Tell your wife, it doesn't matter if I lose my job. I'm still the man of the house. Shout loud. Oh, God, help me. Number two, men must think in terms of purpose, not roles for their identity. Make this conference be the place where you build an Ebenezer here this morning and say, God, that's it. I am a man, not because they tell me so. I'm a man because that's what you produce. Number three, man's identity is found in his purpose, not roles. Therefore, man's underlying purpose transcends culture. It transcends tradition. It transcends roles. And I just destroyed everything that they made you a man from. Oh. You are not a man because of culture. You're not a man because of traditions. Things that you did traditionally. 
He's not a man because of the roles that the social science society tells you to perform. I want you to leave this building today, leave this comfort, go back to your home a free man, free from culture, free from traditions, free from expectated role. I'm a man whether I am doing nothing. If your car is not running, it is still a car. why my wife loves me so much you know I'm a real man she didn't make me a man she found one I'm gonna say that slow my wife didn't make me a man she found one and for 27 years she keeps saying to me every day I'm so glad I married you I said, you bet your bottom dollar you're glad you married me. You got yourself a man who don't need a woman to be a man. He needs a woman to prove he's a man, not to be one. I'm going to say it slow. A real man needs a woman to prove he's a man, not to be a man. See, if I'm a man, I can prove it by being faithful to a woman for 90 years. That's proof. I can prove it by giving her children and then paying their bills. Write this down. If males understand the purpose and the responsibilities God has given them in his design for them they'll be fulfilled as men for the sake of time let me just give you something very fast purpose culture and traditions I think it's what men are suffering from right now you are suffering from the fact that your culture is putting pressure on you and your culture is an amazing thing. Your culture destroyed you and then tells you to be something that it destroyed. That's why 90% of the guys in jail are men. And the other 90% ain't get caught yet. We are angry animals. Because society keeps putting pressure on us, but doesn't help us because it destroyed what they ask us to be. So number one, purpose transcends culture and tradition. Number two, purpose is permanent, but roles are temporary and transitional. And number three, purpose is inherent, but culture is and tradition are pr products of human activity. God created you a man. Society didn't create you a man. God created you a male. Culture doesn't make you a male. That's why some male are having cultural problems. Cross-dressing. Being one thing in the day, something else in the night. Culture is confusing them. The only solution is to discover your purpose. Purpose is the source of meaning. Purpose is the source of identity. Purpose is the source of value. Purpose is the source of worth. Purpose is the source of significance. Purpose is the source of identity and destiny. Purpose is the source of life. Purpose is the source of design. Very important one there. Purpose is the source of uniqueness. Purpose is the source of potential. Each one of these is loaded and is a session all by itself. When you discover your purpose, you discover your meaning, your identity, your value, your worth, your significance, your destiny, your life, your design, your uniqueness, and your potential. Just by discovering one thing. And that's why we, I, I wrote those three books on potential. For you to discover your purpose and your potential. It's key to becoming a great man. Now, look at that list carefully. 
Purpose is the source of meaning for your life, identity for your life, value, worth, significance, destiny, life, design, uniqueness, and potential. Imagine if you don't know your purpose. So, that means you don't know your identity, your meaning in life, your worth, your value, your significance, your destiny, your life, your design, your uniqueness, and your potential. And if you don't know your purpose, you try and find these things other ways. Why would a young man join a gang who comes from a Christian home? Because he can't find his purpose, identity, worth in that family. So he goes searching for it. Purpose is the number one priority of God. My favorite verse in the Bible, Proverbs 19, 21 says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. That means whatever God created you to be, that is the most important thing to God. It prevails over everything. God says, no matter what you plan, my purpose for your life will prevail over all your plans. According to this verse, I learned three things from this verse. Number one, purpose is more important than plans. Number two, purpose is more powerful than plans. Number three, purpose precedes plans. In other words, God said, before you even was conceived to make plans, I already had a purpose for your life. So your purpose is more important than your plans for your life. Therefore, it's critical for you to discover God's purpose for your life as a male so that you won't have to make the wrong plans for your life. What is purpose? i give you a definition here real quick. Purpose is defined as, in the Hebrew, original intent. What is God's original intent is called purpose. Number two, purpose is defined as the cause of creation. It also is defined as the motivation for creation or the desired result of a thing. Purpose is defined as the reason for existence. Purpose is defined as the predetermined destiny of a thing. Purpose is why a thing exists. So if you want to know what a real man is, what a male is supposed to be, you have to find out what was in God's mind when he made the male. It has nothing to do with legislation and government, nothing to do with culture, nothing to do with traditions. It has to do with what was in the manufacturer's mind. That's where you get your purpose from. Matter of fact, uh, purpose is the original intent why a thing exists, therefore, the role of a thing is different from the purpose of it. Purpose is permanent. Roles change. When I go home to my wife, I'm a husband. When I'm with my son and daughter, I'm a father. When I'm in the church, I'm a pastor. The roles keep changing, but I am always a man. <laughs> Clap your hand, all you great men. So if I have a job, I'm a man. If I lose my job, I'm a man. If my business falls up, I'm still a man. You should never allow your identity to be consumed by your role. Your purpose protects you from your role. <laughs> That's something, Bishop. I'm going to say it again. Your purpose protects you from your roles. Why? Because your roles could change. Today, you might be making more money than your wife. Tomorrow, you can lose your job. When you lose your job, you come in with your pink slip and say, Honey, I am still a man. <laughs> clap right there. That's a good place to clap. I am still a man. Why? I am not a man because I have a job. My purpose protects me from my roles. Purpose is the source of design. It's the source that dictates your destiny. Purpose is also the source of product. This one is very critical. 
whatever the purpose of a product is determines the design of the product. In other words, whenever you want something, you build something to get it for you. You just got it. One person got it. Let me say it again. Purpose controls what product you produce. When they made this motorbike, they decided we want a vehicle that can have two wheels, that can be handled by one person. It doesn't need to have a whole lot of weight and all the pistons, all that stuff spread out in a big car. We want something that can go through traffic or can ride in the mountains. And so the purpose that they wanted controlled the design of the product. There's something that God wanted done that made a male necessary. Oh man, help me. <laughs> the male is not a biological accident. There's something God wanted done that made the male necessary. And so God designed you perfectly for what he wanted you to do. That's why you are different from a woman. That's why it's very dangerous to try and make this motorbike a truck. Because it ain't built to carry 10 tons. I got to talk for a second about this. If you try to make this motorbike a truck and you tie 10 tons of dirt in a car behind the motorbike and you try to pull it with the motorbike, it will destroy the motorbike because it's not built for that purpose. That means if a male tries to be a female, <laughs> no matter how he breaks his wrist, wear a ponytail, earrings in his ear, walk funny, no matter what he does, he can't pull it, baby. He can't pull it. He can't pull it. He can't pull it. Oh, Lord. Oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. <laughs> you know, when God made... Listen, I got to go, but listen. When God made Adam and Eve, it's strange. God made two males. Let me prove it. He made a male, and then he went inside the male and took out another male. Now, the first male, the Bible says, he formed from the dust of the ground. He formed. But the second male, he went inside the male, and he pulled out another male, and the, the Hebrew word is different. The Hebrew word says, he built. So men were formed. Women were built. woman, he made a few adjustments. Slight adjustments. And when he brought her to the other male, the other male looked at her and he went, wow. And then he says, she got bone just like my bone, flesh just like my flesh. Oops. He saw something different. He says, but she's different down there. So he said, she's a man, but I'll call her man with the womb. Oh, let me go home now. I will call her the wombed man. That means if you ain't sure you are a man, all you gotta do is check. See if you got a womb, and if you ain't got a womb, you're a brother. Shout amen, somebody. You're a brother. So no 70 bishops can vote 
a womb into your body. No legislation in Parliament or Congress can vote a womb into your body. So don't worry about all the arguments. When a guy comes to you and tells you, you know, hey, tell him, you got a womb? No, then stop faking it. Come on, clap your hands and shout. Oh, hallelujah. Purpose is the source of product. God knew what he wanted, and he made the male to be a male. And he made the fetus male, the male that carries the fetus, to be the fetus male, female. You know, uh, sit down for a second. I got five minutes. Five minutes. I love you too, buddy. <laughs> Purpose is inherent in the product. Write that down. This motorbike comes as a motorbike. You don't make it a motorbike. It's inherent. That means no matter how many operations you have, Oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> Purpose controls everything. I'm talking about it. So your manhood is not up for vote. That's why we brought you here. We got you away from culture, got you away from them women, took you away from them traditions, hide you in a warehouse and say, you are a man, whether they like it or not. Now scream, man. We're men. Sit down quick. There are seven principles I want you to write down real quick. Number one, God is a God of purpose. Number two, everything in life has a purpose. Number three, not every purpose is known. Number four, where purpose is not known, abuse is inevitable. Number five, if you want to know the purpose of a thing, never ask the thing. Oh, man. That's why most men are not men yet, because they keep asking other men, who's a man? Have you ever seen the brothers hanging around the block? You ever hear them talk? Here's how they talk. They say, what's happening, buddy? And the guy says, what's happening? And he goes, what's happening, man? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? See, nobody knows what's happening. <laughs> if you ask this motorbike, why do you exist? It can't tell you. Why? Because number six is critical. Purpose is only found 
in the mind of the manufacturer. Your manhood is buried in the mind of God. Society has no right to define you. Therefore, purpose is the key to fulfillment. You can only be fulfilled when you find out why he made you as a male. I want to close with these four minutes. <laughs> with these four minutes. I was supposed to finish at 10.30. Let me just finish. I want to close with a verse of scripture. Can you turn to it, please? This is where I found the purpose for man. Because the purpose for man is inherent in God's creative process. God is not wondering why he made you. It's very clear. The purpose for the male was established in the mind of God and expressed through his intentions for males. The purpose for the male man is inherent in God's original assignment for you. I'm going to show you why God made you and I'm going to then pray for you and I'm going to quit. Very simple. Genesis 1.26 says, let us make man in our own image, let them have dominion. He's talking about the whole species. So man is your species, but it comes in two models. A male model and a female model. The models are different because of their purposes. In the book of Genesis 1.27, next verse, it says, So God created man in his own image, but he made them in two different models. In the image of God created him, male and female created he them. You know, Ford Motor Company makes motor, motor vehicles, don't they? But they make trucks and cars. But they are all called motor vehicles. But God made man, one species, but he has two models, male and female. Now, a truck and a car perform different purposes. But it's the same company producing the same products but different purposes. Are you with me? So God made man. My wife is a man, spirit being, but she lives in a female body because her function as a female is different from mine. Is that making sense? So the word man, ish, is referring to the species, the spirit being. Spirits have no gender. There is no such thing in scripture as a male or female spirit. It does not exist. So my wife is a man, spirit being, but she lives in a female body. I'm a man, but I live in a male body. So the products are different, but the company produced the same quality of essence. So this verse, he made them male and female, and God blessed them. Look at 2.15. Now here's where God brings the whole thing home. He says, and God took the man, what man? The male man. And he put him where? In the Garden of Eden. And God commanded him three things. Work, cultivate, and protect. Say it. Work, cultivate, protect. Now, God only made one human being from the soil. He never went back. There are 6.7 billion people on earth today, estimate, from the United Nations. And he only made one. Six billion, he only made one. He never went back to the soil. And the first one he made was a male. Now, listen to me carefully. God never gave Eve any instructions. This is heavy. God only spoke to the male. He gave the male all the information. There it is on the board. And God took the male and put him where? In the Garden of Eden and said unto him, work, cultivate, and protect. That's verse 15. Verse 16, he says, and keep this command. So he gave man Eden. He gave man work he gave man cultivation he gave man protection and he gave man his word oh, 
I just gave you a mystery. The male exists for five things. Mind the male exists for Eden. He exists for work. He exists to cultivate. He exists to protect. He exists to instruct. That's your manhood right there. Listen. The word Eden, I researched it for three years. I wrote a book on it. It's out there. It's called Understanding the Purpose for Praise and Worship. The word Eden means moment. It also means spot. It also means presence. So the word Eden is not a place. That's why scientists and archaeologists cannot find Eden. And listen to me, Bishop. Eden is not a place. They can find all kinds of things, but they can't find Eden. Why? But the word Eden means spot, moment, and presence. In other words, the Hebrew definition is very complicated. It actually means the spot for the moment where the presence of God is touching earth. So Eden is an environment where the presence of God kisses earth. So Adam was placed right in the middle of the presence of God. That's why he didn't need to pray and fast and sing or nothing. He was walking in it constantly. And the reason why it's called moment, because it changed location. It was here for the moment, there for the moment. Wherever Adam went, the thing went. So God took the male, and the first place he put him is in the presence of God not the presence of a woman. So the first presence a man needs is not the presence of a woman. So a male who is outside of God's presence, stand up on your feet for a minute, please, is a dangerous male. Hold hands with one another, quick, 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 quick. I feel an anointing flowing here. Oh God. Oh God. Look at me, please. No distraction. Don't let the devil distract you. Look at me. The first place God put Adam is in his presence. Eden, look at me, please. Eden is not a place. It's an environment. That's why they can't find it. When Adam sinned, God took the presence back up. Shh, listen. Please listen. This is so critical. Everything that God created, every product that God created, he designed an environment for it to function in. God created the sea before he created fish. God created the soil before he created trees. God created the firmament before he created birds. God created Eden, Genesis 2, 8, before he created man. In other words, God always prepared the environment before the product. Because every product is designed to function within an environment. If you try to ride this bike through the ocean, that's not the environment for it. Shh, listen. Therefore, fish need water to function. Plants need soil to function. Birds need the air to function. Plants don't want soil. They need soil. Fish don't want water. They need water. Birds don't want the air. They need the air. So the male, 
doesn't want God's presence. Listen. Hold hands, please. Quick, quick, quick. Hold hands. Listen to me. Listen. If you take a fish out of water, it malfunctions and dies. If you took a plant out of soil, it malfunctions and dies. You take a bird from the air and put it in a cage. It malfunctions, can't fly. If you take a male out of God's presence, Eden, he malfunctions. And that's only number one I'm dealing with. That's why when you read the Bible, the temptation of Satan was a very interesting temptation. It wasn't the fruit he was after. He was trying to get them out of Eden. The last verse of Genesis 3 says, and the Lord God drove them from the garden. And ever since then, we've been malfunctioning. Gentlemen, if I could leave you with one thing before I leave this country, it would be this. The most important thing you need in life is what the fish need for water. You don't need a wife first. You don't need work first. You need Eden again. Lift your hand, please. That's why Satan doesn't care if women worship. He doesn't care if women go to church. Satan doesn't want you to do what you're doing right now, lifting your hands. He's afraid of males worshiping. Because when men start worshiping, they start functioning. Lift your voice and begin to speak in tongues. Worship God. Praise Him where you are because that's your first need is His presence. Come on, worship Him. We love you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. Not ashamed to praise you. Not ashamed to worship you. For you are faithful. You are holy. You are righteous. We come into this place to worship you. We came to this retreat to worship you. We came to seek our Father. We came to seek His presence. We came to seek His presence. We came to seek Your presence. For in Your presence, there's fullness of sure. I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I lift up holy hands in the sanctuary and I shout to my God just like David did. You are my strong tower. Oh, that men would praise the Lord. Oh, that men would lift up holy hands. Oh, that men would bless his holy. Go ahead and bless it out loud. If men bless it, men. Don't be afraid, man, to praise God in your house, in your kitchen, in your car. Just praise Him. 
Don't be ashamed as men to praise God in public because it's your secret weapon. That's why David was so powerful. David was not afraid to sing and praise God and to dance before his wife. Oh, that men would bless the Lord. It's your purpose. Don't let nobody praise him for you. Go ahead. Don't look at me. You praise him. Praise him by yourself. Praise him as a male. Let God know you love him. Attract Eden. Brothers, brothers, listen. Listen, listen. Listen to me. Listen to me. Forgive my little extension here, but listen to me. God says... He dwells in the praises. That means if you want Eden to come to earth around you, you can't stand there spectating. He dwells in the... Lift your hands and bring Eden in this place just one more time. And give God praise and praise.